Right, let's uh, make a start, shall we? Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. In uh, today's class, um, we're going to uh, move from capital budgeting to uh, sources of capital. And indeed, well, I'm going to give an outlay of uh, what we've actually covered and what we are going to cover in the next uh, in today's class and also for the next uh, three, uh, the next two weeks. Okay. So that is the um, setup for the, um, the rest of my um, classes with you. But before that, we still have um, example two to finish off with. Now I know that if you've already attended the tutorial, you might say, oh, I can do this. But um, you know, just for completeness, let us all finish, the, uh, finish off tutorial two. Sorry, not tutorial two. Example two. And then that'll be it for the, uh, um, I said last week that this will be the, um, numerically one of the uh, hardest to attempt. So for the rest of my class, all the calculations are pretty um, simplistic compared to this. Okay, So let's finish this off, and then we can move on to more conceptual, more discursive type of topics. Yeah. <laughs> Settle down, please. Thank you. OK. Well, I, I think this is where I left off uh, in, in last week's class. So. When we talk about um, a project that has nested decisions, it is important that we, um, we say something about the decision that occurs later in time because it affects the value that we use to decide on whether to go large or small. Okay, so nested decisions. We are not able to decide on uh, whether to build a large plant or a small plant without first getting some value on the worth of the option to expand for the small plant. Okay, so that's what we said last week about going back to front. And indeed, um, for this particular slide, I've already updated this on DSO. So if you want, you can look at this for yourself later on if you haven't done it. Okay. So these are the uh, detailed calculations. But what what the calculations are about is to is to help us decide whether or not we should actually expand the small plant given that initial demand in the first two years is good, is high. Okay? So that's what the uh, um, calculation is about. And uh, based on those uh, calculations, we uh, of uh, 9, 5, 9, 3, double 5 versus 2.145 million, our decision as far as number two is concerned is that, okay, even though we have the option to expand on the small plant, it is not worth pursuing it is not worth our while to actually uh, expand on a small plant. Okay? So what I said uh, towards the end of uh, last week's class is that um, as far as the uh, top branch of the tree is concerned, see this is the part of the tree that corresponds to the expand scenario. But because we've decided not to expand, this part of the tree is completely irrelevant to us. It does not help us at all in terms of guiding the cal subsequent calculations. This is no longer relevant. Okay, so that's the uh, red part. Now, for the um, bottom half of this particular branch, I've also said um, towards the end of last week's class that um, it doesn't help guide us in our calculation or put differently in terms of our calculation of the MPV of the small plant. This part of the tree or of the picture is no longer relevant. Not because the numbers are irrelevant, but more because we've actually done the calculation for this part of the uh, branch. And the answer is simply 2.145 million. We've already done the calculation, and we know that 2.145 million is sitting here. So that is why I said uh, we no longer need this part of the tree to guide us in our calculation, because we've already done it here. Okay? So that's the idea of using skeleton templates to guide us in our MPV calculation. Okay? So that's where I sort of left off. And um, so you see, if we were to finish off example two to work out the MPV of the small plant, what are the, um, shall we say, what are the parts of this particular um, tree that we need to consider? Now, the first thing I need to consider is simply one million. That's the initial outlay. Okay, so that's the first term that I always write in my MPV calculation for the small plant. Okay, so it's one million. That's the first term. Um, what will be another obvious term? just to get us started with today's class. Anyone? To, to incorporate in our MPV calculation for the small plant. Zero point three five million for the next 
10 years. Okay, so that's the second component that we need to calculate. Okay, and we have to assign a probability weight of 0 0.2 to that. Okay, so there's a 0 0.2 or 20% chance of 0 0.35 million for each of the next 10 years. So that's another component to consider in our MPV calculation. What about another component? Anyone? Well, an obvious one would have to be 2.145 million. It is sitting in year two. So we need to pull it back, divided by 1.09 square. Okay, so that part is sort of locked in as well. We list it down. Um, there's one last thing that we need to consider that may not be that clear from this picture, but we need to consider those two cash flows as well. What are those? We've taken care of the initial outlay. We've taken care of the entire low demand scenario for 10 years. We've taken care of this part of the branch, which is simply 2.145 million sitting in two years' time. There's something else that's left over. Which one? <laughs> High demand net cash flow for the first two years, which is here. Okay, so that's another thing we need to consider, that we have a net cash flow for the first year and for the second year, given high initial demand. Okay, so that's, another, that's the last component we need to incorporate in our MPV calculation. And if you put them all together, it's simply just this. Okay? So the first term is minus 1 million. That's the initial outlay. We've taken care of that, this one. Second term, 0 0.35 million for each of the next 10 years. So that's what the second term in the first line is for. And the probability weight is 0 0.2. So 0 0.2 times 0 0.35 million for each of the next 10 years. So that's the second component. Um, third component would simply be 2.145 million. We've already done the calculation for this part of the branch. So it's uh, 2.145 million sitting in two years' time. So we divide by 1.09. And last but not least, 0 0.4 million for each of the first and second year. So 0 0.4 divided by 1.09 and 0 0.4 divided by 1.09 square. Okay. So you see, if, if you look at this um, near the beginning of last week's class, you look at this and you say, oh, this looks very messy. <laughs> but if you were to relate each of those components to each part of this um, decision tree, it becomes quite easy to handle because you know that, okay, it's just the first term is just for the in initial outlay. The second term is just for the um, 10 years of net cash flow given low demand, and this is for the first two years, and this guy, 2.145 million, I've already done it uh, in the previous slide, when I'm trying to decide between do I expand or do I not expand. Okay, so if you break it up into pieces, it's actually not that bad. Okay? And to really finish up example two, we'll quickly do um, the calculation for the uh, top half. Now, if you think about it, if you just look at the, um, um, if you compare the diagrams for the large plant versus the, versus the small plant, you, you must agree that the diagram for the small plant is a lot more complicated than the large plant. But I mean, if these are all the calculations for the small plant, then the large plant should be easier. I mean, graphically, it is easier than, this is easier than this. So calculation-wise, it should also be easier, okay? Um, I showed this to you last week, so I said, what the bloody hell? Okay, let's forget this for the moment. I know you have this with you. Let's do it by installment. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is the following. Okay? This is, um, um, you can, if you've already mastered this, uh, good on you. But if not, when I was learning all this, I, this is what I do uh, for myself. Okay? I, lab I actually go and label each of the, four compon uh, each of the uh, relevant components. So if I'm, if I ha once I have this diagram in front of me, this is what I do. Okay? Okay, so I, I basically marked out each of the four calculations that I need to include to work out the MPV of the small plant. So the first one, which is always the easiest, my favorite, is initial outlay. Minus two million, no need to discount because it's already at time zero. Okay, so that's the easiest. Um, so if I were to work out the calculation for part two, um, Roman symbol number two, um, 0 0.1 million with a probability of 0 0.2 for each of the next 10 years. That's easy to do as well. Number three, you know, I have to take some probability weighted expected cash flow for the eight years. 
and then pull it back further. And number four is just the net cash flow for the first and second year. Okay, so if I do it by installment, it's not too bad. So let's try to work out the calculation bit by bit. Okay, doing it in steps rather than looking at this. Okay, so let's ignore this for the moment and see how this picture guides us in our calculation. Okay, so far so good, I hope. Um, the first term is just <laughs> minus 2 million, so that's very easy. Second term, okay, 20% um, probability of 0 0.1 million for each of the next 10 years. So that's number two. What about number three, the third component? So for the third component, it's about a stream of eight cash flows for the third year to the tenth year. So that's eight of them. So that's why the annuity is uh, to the power eight. Uh, let me write this. Um, this power term is eight. Okay. So the overall cost of capital is nine percent, and this is the probability weighted cash flow of zero point eight million um, with a three quarter chance and zero point one million with one quarter chance. Okay. So that's the uh, weighted cash flow for each of the next um, um, eight years. It's a stream of eight cash flows. Two million is sitting at time zero. What about the second term? Where is it sitting at? Now if you ask a calculator, this is a number, but where is this number sitting at? It is also sitting at time zero. Following on third term, this number, whatever that is, again you ask your calculator, it is not sitting at time zero, it is sitting at time two. To pull it in line with the first and second term, all we need to do is, yep, 1.09 square, pull it to year zero. And last but not least, It's like paying off a home loan. We do it by parts. <laughs> 0 0.8 million for the first year and second year, which is um, which is this. Okay, for the first two years. And these are the simple calculations. Now at this stage, if you follow through all the calculations, the actual final answer is really not that interesting anymore. <laughs> okay, because uh, you know that realistically we don't do this by hand you use some software to actually calculate it for you. But if you can follow through with this, and more importantly, relate this to um, the diagram, this is not important to you anymore. Because what we have here in front of us is exactly the same as that. The only difference is the sensation. Because if you see it in one shot, you might say, oh, oh, this is horrible. But if you do it in parts, you get the exact same answer. Everything that I've written here is there. Uh, you might not believe me, but that's what the weekend is for, okay? So you go and spend some time and compare the two. You get exactly the same. Okay. So this looks horrible. This looks quite okay. So you must believe that this is not something impossible for you, okay? And yeah, and uh, if it's still a bit iffy, that's what the tutorial questions are for. And if it's not there, if you don't still fully get it, well, I mean, that's what my office hours are for, so you can always uh, pay me a visit tomorrow. Most of the time, I'm just looking up in the ceiling. Okay? Nobody comes and visit me. But, okay? So uh, I've some, I always have times on Fridays, so come and visit me if you want. Okay? Well, other than that, that's pretty much uh, as, as hard as it gets for the calculation, but I mean, is it really hard if you look at it this way? 
why is this difficult? It's just minus two. <laughs> what about this? Oh, you know, it's just an annuity calculation. What about this? Just working out some probability average cash flow and then apply annuity. And knowing that it is in year two, we just divide by 1.09 square. And last but not least, these two guys are easy. 0 0.8, first year, pull it back. Second year, pull it back. 1.09 square. Okay. So, so that's, the, uh, that's how using um, diagrams break up comprehensive project details very easily. Okay. So keep this in mind. And indeed, this will be as comprehensive as it gets, as far as we're concerned. Okay. If you understand the basic methodology, even for more compl complicated, more comprehensive details, the, the thought process is the same. Whether it is one, two, one, two, three, or with inception, one, two, three, four, <laughs> okay, four layers or five layers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Right. So, so that's uh, pretty much what I uh, am able to uh, uh, share with you in terms of uh, capital budgeting. So now, uh, as we move on into um, going from capital budgeting into um, um, sources of capital, and indeed, I've said on uh, um, on the uh, unit notice board that that the mode is going to switch. It's going to become more discursive, uh, more storytelling, and less numbers. But there's still some quantitative, uh, um, simple calculations involved. So when I was planning this, uh, uh, my, my, my um, workshops at the beginning of the uh, trimester, I was hoping that over the six workshops, regardless of what type of student you are, you have an overall balance of concepts and calculations. So that's the best I can do in terms of an overall type of experience to offer you. Okay. Now in terms of um, taking stock and Preview, review. Uh, I think I put some slides on uh, what I was, what was I thinking? Review and preview and blah blah blah. So what I'll do is uh, I'll give you a better uh, way of um, my way of uh, seeing, how, rather to show you how I actually plan out my uh, workshops. I, I've shown you this before, but I think it's good that we uh, revisit this again. Okay, it's a very simple. Uh, Don't, you don't have to copy this down, okay? This is in your formula sheet and you don't really need this anyway, okay? But I'm not writing this to teach you anything new, but I'm actually using this to help organize your thought process. That's what I'm really, uh, what I can say I'm sort of good at when I was uh, learning finance. Um, See, in the first three classes, what we did with, uh, with uh, capital budgeting is to take from a simplistic NPV analysis and we do sort of uh, different adjustments, whether it is to NPV or indeed to the uh, expected net cash flows to address various aspects of uncertainty. Because you've got to keep in mind, all your, your NPV is the one number that helps you decide, accept or re reject, but it is itself based on a set of estimates. So in terms of um, analyzing the uh, risk and uncertainty of the um, cash flow estimates is quite important to, to give a more realistic uh, NPV analysis. So things like certainty equivalent valuation, decision tree analysis, those sort of things. That's what we are trying to address. Um, the top half, the top part of this, and also with um, scaling the NPVs for projects of different lives, so we can compare across different types of uh, project across. Sorry, so that we can compare projects across different investment horizons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so that's what we've covered. Now, a standard first and second level type corporate finance course would also teach the following. Okay, your weighted average uh, cost of capital, which for the, uh, as far as um, my part of the cost is concerned, concern, it's always given to you, some number, whether it's 
10%, 12%, etc., etc. et cetera. But in terms of getting it, this, another part of a course would always teach you the estimation part of it to work out the average, uh, sorry, the weighted average uh, cost of capital. And indeed, what you did with a portfolio theory and capital asset pricing model in your pre-reg is one way of estimating it. Okay, your cost of equity is estimated as uh, your RF plus the beta of your stock um, expected return on market minus RF. Okay, so that's uh, another branch of the, uh, uh, another set of topics that you would cover. Okay, so that's not what uh, I'm going to cover. What I am going to cover is actually this. See, two things are given to you, the overall cost of capital and the initial outlay. You know, with the uh, previous example, small plan, one million, large plan, two million. Where does the money actually come from? You know, it doesn't just appear out of nowhere. So what we're going to do for the next few, uh, for the rest of my course is to show you the different channels by which uh, funds can be raised to fund hopefully um, good, profitable, positive NPV projects. Okay? So that's um, that particular blueprint. And if we then take it to try to preview what we're going to cover, it's actually the following. So you can probably guess when I was studying finance as a student, I don't really have to uh, do much revision because I use pictures to uh, summarize topics. So as when, when during exam time, it's always very easy for me because I don't have to memorize things. <laughs> I just uh, use pictures to help me uh, answer exam questions. So you see, one way of uh, looking at it would be the following, okay? Um, you're standing here. Okay, this is a, try not to think of this as a timeline. Okay? <laughs> We've had our field of timelines already. You're standing here with a bright idea. Uh, so the next stage is to always say, okay, I have an idea. I think it's going to sell, but I need a sum of money to operationalize on the idea. So this is a word borrowing from marketing. You have to operationalize on this idea. So you need a sum of money to uh, run it as a business. So the first stage is always taking an idea and turning it into something that um, can be marketed, can be sold, etc., etc. So stage one, for example, you will form a company, a uh, private company, propri proprietary limited. Okay? So get a sum of money and uh, start up a company. And the sort of uh, funds that you often uh, go to seek out the, um, to, to start up a company would be, you know, um, All these are written on the slides, okay? But I just want to put everything together on one single picture. Trust fund, family trust, borrow from your parents, uh, go to a bank, borrow a sum of money to start up a company, and indeed, uh, this thing called venture capital. So raise it from out, um, a group of people who have money lying around, and they'll give it to you, of course, in return for something else, okay? So that's uh, all those uh, common channels for which you can raise funds to turn an idea into a uh, private company and try to uh, initiate your idea, get it off the ground. And indeed, if things go well for you, you go to the next stage. Anyone will be an obvious guess of what the next stage will be going from this? From a private company? Yeah, you drop the PDY <laughs> and you simply become LTD. So that's where you say, okay, go public. And that's the uh, process of um, Okay, keywords like uh, IPOs, initial public offerings, the phrase going public, I'm going to float my company. So those are the phrases that you associate to move from private to public. Okay, so drop PTY becomes LTD. So it becomes a publicly listed company on the relevant countries' uh, stock exchange. So for us, it's the Australian Securities Exchange. Okay. Um, but I mean, the story doesn't end there. Even if you're a listed company, you do. The, the, the ultimate goal of a listed company, uh, if you re remember the things you learned from your pre reg would be to uh, maximize shareholders' value, seek growth, etc., etc. So in the process of you seeking growth, you do need to raise further capital on a regular basis to finance new projects, more projects, higher value, more cash inflow, more NPV, etc., etc. So as you seek growth, you're going to have a series of um, additional channels by which to raise funds by issuing one of a few things, equity, 
that the EBT uh, bonds or the last thing which is something in between that we call hybrid securities. Okay, so you're going to issue um, more equity, more bonds or debt securities or indeed if you can't make up your mind between either one or the other, issue something in the middle, hybrid securities. So these are what we call season, uh, season offerings by publicly listed companies to issue, uh, to raise either equity, to raise debt or to raise um, hybrid capital. Again, all the uh, slides for today's workshop is about looking at each of them, and indeed, that's what we're going to do for the next uh, two weeks as well. Okay, so we're going to look at the mechanics of the different sources by which a company can raise money, rights issue, um, private placement is another one, and then there's a few others. Okay, um, conver convertible notes, converting preference shares. Again, those two will be covered in uh, the week six, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, as you see growth, again, this is just giving you a preview of the uh, today's class and the next uh, two weeks. We can't say, okay, uh, company grow, 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 everybody's happy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even among listed companies, there is still some target to try that you try to achieve to sort of set you out from the rest. It doesn't mean that okay, once you become a publicly listed company, the story ends there. Even among the realm, within the realm of uh, publicly listed companies, there are, shall we say, different tiers and different levels and different um, sense of satisfaction, so to speak. You see, so what do you think would be a very clear, specific, concise, no disagreement way of, of ranking companies, publicly, publicly listed companies? on the stock exchange. Market capitalization is, always, is uh, one way that you can gauge. But it's not really immediately clear as to whether one company will be larger than another company because of all these adjustments with different things. But one thing would really set it out in terms of, even if you're non-finance, you can actually appreciate the uh, distinction there. What is being used to gauge quality by a stock exchange? How does a stock exchange say, you're tier one, Tier two, I don't even want to talk to you. About it. Anyone? How, how does the stock exchange actually go about classifying companies in terms of quality? Sorry? Again, that's uh, subjected to the measures, but something very simple, very specific. Again, if you look at two stocks that tra track really closely, you can't really tell. I'm talking about the entire population. Very simple, clear. If we want to say, I'll get us started. If we want to say something about, okay, for today, how has the Australian stock market performed? What is the one thing we always look towards as a sort of summary measure? That's the word I'm looking for. Um, the one that we uh, look to is either the all odds or something that is very similar is the ASX S&P 200. Okay, so the, uh, to, for a company to be included in an index is where we differentiate between different types of companies. So we start with, uh, let, let, let me just uh, start with uh, the Australian Securities Exchange. ASX S&P 200 is the yardstick, okay, because that's the one that local and foreign investors use to gauge the company. So if you're a company Sorry, to gauge the overall market. So if you're a company that's in that index, you're at a different level. Because in terms of coverage, in terms of, in terms of the marketing, people know who you are because you're part of that top tier 200 type thing. And indeed, even within that, there's further uh, differentiations. Going from 200 to ASX S&P 100 to the 50 majors, and then going to right to the top, your 20 leaders. Okay? Those 20 leader stocks are things that everybody knows. Okay, your, your, your four banks, your major mining companies, and your large retailers. So those are the ones at the top. So as the company seeks growth, what it strives to achieve is to climb the index ladder. Okay, so from 200 to 100 to 50 to 20. And indeed, uh, it's the same case with the US. We start with the Russell 2000, ASX, uh, sorry, the S&P 500, S&P 100, and then go to the top of the range is the uh, Dow Jones 30. Okay, so that's the... Uh, um, index hierarchy, and so that's the one that's used to gauge how prestigious a company actually is. Okay. But anyway, most of what we do in terms of uh, working out the uh, um, is trying to find out okay, what are the various sources by which a company can raise capital as it tries to take from 
going from one to reach the end, which is climb the index ladder. And indeed, most of what we would cover will be on this too. Um, IPOs, and indeed next week's class is mostly on IPO, the, this so-called IPO underpricing and the role of underwriters in the IPO process. And other things that we'll look at, for example, towards the end of today's class is this thing called rights issue. So uh, you can raise new equity by floating a company, and then after you become a publicly listed company, you can raise equity from existing shareholders, or you can raise money from new shareholders or both. Okay, so the different channels to raise funds. So most of our classes uh, for today and the next two weeks will focus on these two stages. The, um, the IPO, which is the initial stage, and season offerings of equity and hybrid securities, which we'll cover. And that'll be it for my part of the course. Okay? So if you have this in mind, when you then do your revision, I don't know, hopefully a few days before the exam, then this will guide you in terms of your, um, how you arrange concepts. Right, well, let's, uh, okay, so for today's uh, learning objective, a bit on what is venture capital, what is IPO. Most of the uh, mechanical issues would revolve around a uh, rights issue. So rights issue is something that is made to existing shareholders. And indeed, to work out the value of the right and the uh, theoretical x right price. So what is the uh, nature of uh, have an example. Uh, what's the uh, nature of capital? I guess that's uh, one way of looking at it. Is it the um, um, you know, I mean there's one slide on debt capital, there's one slide on equity capital. But I mean, let's uh, go to the uh, key aspects of it. If I have to What's going on? Yeah, I know. I'm the one who has to do all the talking. <laughs> so have some pity on me. Thank you very much. Is that the reason? Yeah, I know. So what do you want me to do? <laughs> That's why I'm an off-campus student. Um, <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. Now it's really getting to me. Um, the uh, person sitting in the front, stop, uh, <laughs> remember inception, okay, you're dreaming, okay, so nothing is real. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, very funny. Okay, come on, let, let, let's be serious, okay, this is an important class, regardless of the... Uh... <sighs> okay, serious, let, 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 I mean, we, we only get to see each other. <laughs> okay, so, Come on, we only, get, we only get to see each other for two hours a week. Let's focus, okay? Let's focus. I, wa I was a bit worried there that it was me, the problem, why students are leaving, but okay, if it's smell, then it's not my problem. Unless those two are highly correlated, I, I don't think that's the case. If I were to ask you, okay, these are the slides that you can read for yourself, okay, let's go into the basic. I, I like to get right into the uh, key concepts. If I were to ask you this question, what the hell is that smell? No, if I were to ask you this question, can you list out the key difference between equity and debt? What, would, what are the key differences, anyone? I mean, how would you tell them apart in terms of the key differences about equity and debt? Because if you have to decide between whether you want to become an equity holder or a debt holder, it is an important question. <laughs> Key difference. is the, uh, in terms of the cash flow obligation on the part of the company. See, with equity, 
you don't really have to promise them dividends. Sure, if you cut their dividends or if you skip a dividend payment, you might get the uh, tomatoes thrown at you uh, at the annual general meeting, but life still goes on. You may have to endure a bad smell at the annual general meeting, but life still goes on. But if you're not able to service that payments, you're in trouble. You'll be forced into receivership or liquidation. Okay, so that's the, uh, the riskiness of using debt. You don't have to service uh, equity holders. You don't have to prom Of course, you would say, oh, I promise you capital gains. I promise you constant or increasing dividends. But you don't have to. If you, don't, if you are not able to meet it, life still goes on. But if you cannot make an interest repayment, if you're not able to service your debt, you get into this thing called cost of financial distress. And indeed, the, uh, the unit chair is going to cover that with you in due cost, okay? cost of financial distress. So that's the, uh, that's the key aspects of it, okay? the importance of it. If you use um, the, the payments of dividends, doesn't really have any tax benefits to the company. But if you were to use uh, um, borrow debt, if you were to borrow money, you have to pay interest. But there's a tax benefit that comes with it because those interest expenses are tax deductible. Okay, so that's why when Ho comes in later in the week to uh, to talk to you about. Um, the trade-off between how much debt to use or how, how much to borrow or how little to borrow is always a trade-off. And the two key aspects of the trade-off is you borrow more money, you can enhance your return and you can uh, reduce your um, tax expense because it's tax deductible, but you cannot borrow too much money. If you borrow too much, you get into danger because you have to service those uh, um, uh, loan obligations. Okay, So that's always this uh, trade-off between how much or how little to borrow. E over B and D over B, the, the ratio of it. Okay. So that's one key aspect of it. Another key aspect, I guess, is uh, with debt holders, their mindset is, uh, is, is always for a specified shorter run horizon. Say, uh, if you issue bonds, for a company to issue bonds, say we issue five-year bonds. So as far as the relationship between the company and debt holders are concerned, it's only five years. It's pre-specified. But with equity holders, so long as the company is there, you can be a shareholder for many, many years to come. Okay, so there's no pre-specified length for equity holders, but there is a pre-specified investment horizon for debt holders. So that's another key difference. Um, of course, uh, and I guess another key aspect I can share with you is that, uh, okay, if things go wrong, both parties want a piece of what's left of the company. So what can you say about the, uh, shall we say, the packing order in terms of who get access to what's left of the company, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Debt holders would get ranked ahead of equity holders. Okay, debt holders and employees will get paid first, and then if there's anything left, equity holders will get it. Okay, so so that's always this uh, packing order, and indeed, uh, as far as dividend payments are concerned, you cannot pay dividends on one hand and say, "I'm not going to pay you any interest payments." Okay, it doesn't work that way. You have to fulfill all your debt servicing obligations, all your interest repayments, all your salaries before you pay dividends. Okay, so that's the uh, ranking of um, equity and debt holders. Okay, so those are some of the, the key differences I can think of under current circumstances. But for the rest of it, you can uh, have a read for yourself. Okay, the key difference there. Now, hybrid securities is something that we're, we're going to cover in week six. The fact that they are called hybrid securities, and based on what I've just discussed with you, you can pretty much guess what they are. I mean, you, you may not know the specific mechanics of the instrument, but you will at least know that, oh, okay, hybrids must be some sort of, anyone? Yeah, some sort of mix between equity and debt. Okay, for the most part, uh, I'll share two with you, but you, you don't, we'll cover this more formally in week six. A very common type of uh, uh, hybrid securities is this thing called convertible notes or convertible bonds. Now, convertible bonds, they start off when we issue them to investors, those investors are debt holders. Okay, it's a debt instrument. It promises you regular uh, interest repayments, but with one difference. You see, with a normal bond, if you if a company issues normal debt on a normal bond, when it matures, the company has to pay back the principal amount or the face value. But with a convertible bond, that might not happen because the uh, bondholder, the convertible bondholder, can say, "Okay, things are really looking nice." and smell nice, so I do not want to... <laughs> I'm trying to bluff myself. Um, please keep the face value. Do not repay me the principal amount. I like to be a shareholder. I like a piece of the action. So a, a debt holder then evolves to become an equity holder. Okay, so that's what a hybrid security does. 
Um, another one would be converting preference shares. Now, with converting preference shares, you are actually an equity holder, but the amount of cash flows that you are receiving, it is as if you are a debt holder because you receive a fixed income stream. Okay, so I mean, those are, and with converting preference shares, you could also end up becoming an equity holder, ordinary shareholder. Okay, so that's um, um, yeah, some preview of what this is. Okay, so it's either equity, debt, or some hybrid between the two. Oh, dear me, dear me. Um, so with uh, yeah, with equity capital, if you're you know if you are trying to start up, launch a new idea, you get into venture capital, you know, tr or borrow money from a bank, from the family trust fund to start up your company, and then if things really go well, you float your company through an IPO. Okay, so that's what these two lines are for. And even after your publicly listed company, you may have to raise funds on a regular basis. So that's where. Um, um, you do things like rights issue to existing shareholders, private placements to new shareholders, and this thing called dividend reinvestment plan, which we'll talk about uh, next week as well. Okay, so these are the common channels by which Australian companies uh, raise funds. Okay. And in terms of deciding, so you see, we've got all these different channels, for example, for which uh, an existing publicly listed company can raise funds. It, I mean, a reasonable question would be, okay, how do I decide? I mean, do I do a rights issue? Do I go a private placement? Do I use internal funds, etc. Et so what helps me to decide uh, how do I actually go about raising funds for an existing publicly listed company? So some of the things you have to consider are things like cost. You know, how much does it cost you to uh, raise funds through a rights issue, through a private placement, etc., etc. Uh, the time it takes for you to actually get the money at the end. And also, these things, these things are important. The implications for the wealth transfer, sorry, for the transfer of wealth and or voting rights of existing shareholders. If you were to make a, a, an equity uh, capital raising to new shareholders, that may have an implication to existing shareholders in terms of diluting their voting rights, their ownership percentage, and also their um, wealth. Etc. Etc. So these are the things that we have to uh, have a think about because those uh, the decision on how do you raise funds has to be approved by shareholders. Okay, it has to go through the formal approval process. Okay, yeah. And venture capital, I only have one slide on this, so this is not something that is um, that big over here. But in the U.S., it's very big. See, venture capital is always uh, the, the sort of the companies that go that are funded by venture capital. You see, with startup companies, if it's just an idea, and then you're trying to start it up to get it off the ground, what can you actually say about those sort of companies in their first, say, two to four years? Anyone? It's just common sense. How would you describe those companies in their first two to four years? They are very risky. I mean, ex ante, well, this is a nice idea, but we don't really know how the market is going to react to this and things like that. So it's very risky. That, that's one thing. Okay, so venture capital investment is very risky. Those startup companies, they are very innovative, but innovative means that uh, the market hasn't seen this before, so they might not like it. That's one characteristic. They are, they are highly risky uh, um, um, product um, companies. What about another uh, characteristics in the first two to five years in terms of, say, expected net cash flow? Anyone? Sorry? Um, unpredictable. Yes, it has a lot of volatility, but I'm looking for something a bit stronger. It's normally either zero or negative. They don't have any cash flows in the first few years. Because it's startup, yeah, and indeed a lot of the uh, U.S. startup companies, what they actually pay their employees are not salaries; they actually pay them stock options. <laughs> they say, that, okay, if things go well for us in four years' time, you'll be bloody rich. But if things go bad, too bad, <laughs> you get nothing. Okay, so they are they are promised something at the end if it's successful. Okay, so that, that's how they that's how they can afford to pay their employees. They pay them options. So if things go well, they become public, and then those options become very valuable. Okay, so that's uh, venture capital. And indeed, a specific type of venture capital investment is what is this thing called private equity funds. You might have heard of this phrase before: private equity, private equity investment, etc., etc. This is a, a sort of a, I wouldn't say that they are exactly hedge funds, but those it's a fund set up by venture capitalists, 
and what they go out to seek for are those types of startup companies that idea might be good, but they unfortunately run into cash flow problems, so they're in financial distress. So what those uh, venture capitalists would do is they, they inject private equity into those companies to save them, to get them through these uh, hard times. And then if things go well, then the payoffs are huge. So what those uh, private equity fund investment, this investment style, what it actually does, it, it goes through the entire realm of um, startup companies and it tries to pick up those that are distressed, but those with huge potential. So in a way, you can think that they're actually buying lottery tickets. So you buy 10 lottery tickets, you only need one company to do well, then the payoffs are huge. You don't really care about probability, okay, you're just buying lottery tickets. So that's one way of looking at uh, private equity funds. So it's very risky and often non-transparent. Okay. Now IPO, like I said, flotation, going public, unseasoned equity offering, etc., etc. you can only do it once, okay, so you only become public initially just once. After that, it's, it becomes seasoned equity offerings. And indeed, the, uh, it involves, uh, there's two, you know, I wouldn't say type, but there's two slightly different forms of initial public offering. The first one is not as common. Now, the second one is more common. It's the setting up of a company. You raise money. Now, the fund that is raised goes to the company itself. It goes direct to the company. So the ones, the big ones, or at least the household names that we've seen in recent years will be your Commonwealth banks, your Telstra's, your Coast. Now it's West Farmers, and indeed the uh, AMP shares, and uh, Myers shares as well, more, um, more recently. But there's another type that is less common, but I thought I'd just briefly mention to you, is uh, some of the funds that are raised actually go to the existing stakeholders. Now like AMP is one example. When AMP demutualized, the policyholders actually get some money in the, uh, in the mail, because they are the ones who actually own this company as the policyholders. Okay, so, so sometimes part of the money actually goes to employees or to the uh, existing stakeholders. Another example I can think of that you might uh, find a bit relevant is, uh, is the same thing with futures exchanges or derivative exchanges and also stock exchanges. See, when they demutualize, as in going public with the ASX and uh, Sydney Futures Exchange, now the emerged is called Australian Securities Exchange, okay, but when they demutualize, the members of, say, the Sydney Futures Exchange, they actually get the money because they were the ones who actually have the license to trade the derivative contracts on the Sydney Futures Exchange trading floor. So because the company then goes public, they are being compensated for losing that ownership of that exclusive access. So they are being paid that money. Of course, they can use the money to then become shareholders, but that's a different story. Okay, so this phrase called demutualization is about a company going public, but part of the funds raised actually go to the stakeholders, the members, the policyholders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. But for the most part, this is the more common one. Okay, with uh, with uh, pub, uh, companies going public, and the funds raised goes to the company itself. It's the company that uh, invests in projects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And indeed, uh, three weeks ago, uh, uh, the, one of the largest in IPO history uh, was launched in Shanghai with the Agricultural Bank of China. So close to 23 million. So that uh, could be the largest in history. I'll talk a bit more on this when we look at IPO underpricing, but just as a minor distraction for our current unfortunate events. Anybody have a clear, uh, as, as some sort of rough idea on for the Agricultural Bank of China? It's not number one. I think it's one of the top five banks in China, but it, it is definitely not the one and two. Any idea on the customer base? Some ballpark figure? No? Sorry? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, but doesn't matter. Yeah, I know, I'm asking any idea on the size of the customer base in terms of numbers. I'll ask a slightly different question. Any idea on the uh, size of the Australian population as a percentage of the customer base of the Agricultural Bank of China? <laughs> no, Australia's population as a percentage of the Agricultural Bank of China's customer base. Six point seven percent. So that's our population as a percentage of their customer base. Um, 
Now with IPOs, <laughs> and, and, and it, I can't imagine if I were to, because see, other than coming here every Thursday to teach and having to experience all these mechanical difficulties, I'm also running a research center. It's a three year, 200,000 uh, uh, research center. And we look at how China markets actually interact with uh, Asia Pacific and Australian markets. So one of the duties as the director of this research center is I have to host visitors. So sometimes I'm afraid they will actually ask me questions like, um, you know, so, so Australia is grappling with population growth from 6.7% uh, um, of one of our bank's uh, customer base uh, to 8.3% uh, of our bank's customer base in 10 years' time. <laughs> so you're grappling with uh, what appears to them are small percentages, but to us, it's actually a huge percentage change, because from 20 something, 23 million to 30 something million is 50%, but to them, it's 6.7% uh, to 8. something percent. <laughs> So these are the uh, things that uh, I have to prepare answers for. But anyway, with IPOs, uh, you can imagine. See, with IPOs, there's no history or there's no publicly known history of what a company does or the track record of the company. So a lot of uh, preparation has to go in terms of informing potential investors on what we do, sorry, on what they do, what they are going to do in terms of future cash flows. Um, the risk and the rewards involved in if you were to invest in those companies. So a lot of the costs actually goes into the preparation to satisfy all the listing requirements, the regulatory requirements, and indeed the preparation of the prospectus. It's a very lengthy and tedious process with uh, IPOs. Okay. Some of the terms that we, uh, if you talk about IPO, they work. One of the important things to, to decide on is actually the issue price. We'll talk more on the underpricing aspects of it uh, next week, but in terms of working out, okay, what price would you like to offer your shares at? These are the common mechanics of it, okay? Fixed pricing, constrained um, open pricing, and book building. It is not something that I would uh, go into details because you see we are corporate finance, less on investment, so, but I thought I'll, I'll just provide this uh, set of details for you in case you have to. If you hear people talk about them, then you say, oh, constraint open pricing means they give us a range and they ask us to put in prices at within that range and how much we want to buy, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So I'll give this to you as some sort of uh, background information for your own uh, knowledge. Okay? But what we will look at and what I'd like to emphasize on for the rest of today's class is this thing called rights issue. Okay? So this is something that um, is tractable. Uh, it has some structure in it and hopefully it would guide us for the rest of uh, today, uh, today's workshop. As far as the uh, formula sheet goes, it's these two guys, okay? R and X. Of course, I'll define them properly in due course, okay? But as far as the formula sheet goes uh, for rice issue, these are the two expressions that apply to us if there's to be any calculation, okay? These two, uh, these two expressions. Now, as a very quick preview, if you look at these two expressions, you might say, um, oh, they look much easier than those we have to handle before. Because you see, with either of these two expressions, it's a bit of addition, a bit of subtraction, a bit of multiplication, and a bit of division. So that's a lot easier than something like this, or this, or this, or this. Um, hopefully, you will understand towards the end of the workshop why I say the following. As far as I'm concerned, these two expressions are a lot more superior to everything that we've done thus far. Everything we've done thus far, they may look complicated, but there's no conceptual structure behind them. They're just a matter of saying, okay, there's a set of cash flow in the first year, second year, third year, etc., etc. How do we pull them back? So it's just a mechanical uh, summary of how do you do calculations and simple algebra to relate between, for example, MPV infinity and equivalent annual value, etc., etc. But there's quite a bit of structure that goes into these two expressions, even though it's just addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Okay? But as far as uh, finance is concerned, these two guys are superior expressions. And hopefully, you can see that towards the end of uh, today's class. Okay? I'll define those notations in due course, okay? so you don't have to worry about that. But let's uh, start with a ba very basic discussion on what is a rights issue. As the name implies, okay, first of all, rights issues is made to existing shareholders. Okay, so if you're all existing shareholders in my company, if you're back, no, I won't talk about it. Okay, if you're all my existing shareholders, if I'm the company, then I'm making this, I'm trying to raise additional equity by offering a rights issue to you. It's only open to existing shareholders. For uh, every 
certain number of shares that you hold, I'm giving you the right to buy additional new shares at a discount to current market price. Okay, that's what the right issue basically involves. I'm offering existing shareholders an opportunity to buy new shares at a discount of current market price. It has to be at a discount. And I'll make sure I set it up so that I don't get distracted myself. Do not even think about the following. Um, oh, what about uh, rights issues uh, offering uh, new shares to existing shareholders at a premium? Why is that uh, silly? If I offer you new shares at a premium to existing shareholders, it, uh, I'm a laughing stock simply because. If you want more shares, you will simply just buy off the market. So my <laughs> rights issue to you is completely ludicrous if I offer it to you at a premium. It has to be at a discount. Okay, I have to offer you um, the right to buy new shares at a discount. So imagine you saying this to your shareholders, I'm giving you the right to, because you are existing shareholders, I'm giving you the right to buy new shares at a premium. <laughs> you know, look silly, okay? So it has to be a discount, so don't ask those sort of uh, questions and distract everyone, okay? And the pre uh, sorry, but the discount is always set as anywhere between 10 to 30 percent, depending on how desperate the company is, etc., etc. Okay, but normally it's between 10 to 30 percent. Soon enough, hopefully you'll see why the amount of discounting is actually irrelevant. It is completely irrelevant. Okay, you'll see that uh, soon enough. Okay, so but in terms of the mechanics, it is always offered to existing shareholders at a discount. Uh, it, it is definitely faster than IPO. Okay, it takes two to three months. You do need to prepare some prospectus, but you see the pro prospectus for a rights issue is a lot more uh, thinner or it's a lot more condensed than the prospectus for IPO. Simply because, anyone, quickly? Yeah, it's offered to existing shareholders who already have shares in our company, so we don't have to tell them as much. We probably have to tell them details as far as okay what this rights issue what the money we raise from this rights issue is meant to for is meant for we might want to say something about okay we plan to have these two new projects in the next two years we need the money so we are raising this money to address that issue um etc etc okay but you don't have to have as much information because it's to existing shareholders and following on it is cheaper than ipo okay it, it is cheaper than ipo one of the key questions you have to ask, if you are an existing shareholder of any Australian company, and if you're offered a rights issue, the first question that you should ask, I think, and I'm talking not as a teacher, but as an investor, because <laughs> I invest in uh, quite a few companies, um, is whether the rights are actually renounceable. Renounceable means this is the benefit that's given to me as an existing shareholder, the right to buy new shares at a discount. If for whatever reason I do not wish to participate in this, say if I have cash flow problems, I can't buy the shares myself, it is still a benefit to me. Am I able to sell the benefit to somebody else? Am I able to renounce my rights to third parties? So that's the, the key question. Okay, are you, If you so choose not to do it yourself, not to sus subscribe to the rights issue yourself, are you able to sell it off, renounce it to other parties and get compensation in that regard? Okay, are they renounceable? So you see, um, if you exercise your rights and buy new shares at a discount, you get the benefit, the benefit of buying new shares at a discount. Or if you choose not to subscribe to the rights issues, if you sell those rights, you get compensation as well. So if you participate in the rights, you get a bargain transaction, you benefit. You sell the rights, you get compensation, it's a benefit as well. Okay? But you have to do either one of uh, those two things to get the benefit. If you do nothing, if you do not participate in this offer, and if you do not sell it, if you're able to sell but you choose to do nothing, then what would happen is uh, you have a wealth transfer. Those other existing shareholders that actually do one of the following, either use the right or sell it, they benefit at your expense if you choose to do nothing. And this is important because this has implications for um, wealth transfer. The uh, share price after the um, event, the relevant cutoff date for to decide whether or not you are able, you are entitled to the rights, uh, um, is important, and we'll talk about that soon enough. But the share price after that due date drops. Again, we'll talk properly as to why it drops, etc., etc. Okay. But again, to reiterate, an important question is: if you're not, are those rights given to you? 
tradable? Can you transfer it to someone else and get money, um, a compensation from it? Okay. We'll do one last slide and then we'll take a break. God knows we need it. Okay. So, <laughs> rights issue. Okay. An important, uh, another important feature in piece of information for any rights offer from any company is this the X right date. Now the X right date sounds very familiar. It sounds uh, so there's something else that is uh, common to all shareholders that sounds like an X right date. It's not X right but X something else. Anyone? Take a guess please. X if you're a shareholder you don't get interest repayments but you do get what from companies? Starts with D. You get dividends. So when the, when a company declares a dividend, an important date is this thing called the X dividend date. Okay, so the X right date is very similar to this X dividend date. The X dividend date cutoff point decides whether or not you are entitled to the dividends that is being declared. Okay, so it's a cutoff date. The X right date acts very similarly to that. Okay, and if you pass that date, the share price is actually going to fall. And indeed, after the break, we're going to try to get everything together to understand why is it that the share price fall, why is it that there's valuation, etc., etc. Okay, so let's uh, follow the normal routine. Now it's what 5:03, so 10 minutes. Okay, well we start at 5:13, uh, 5:13 p.m. Okay, I'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Just uh, me me mechanical adjustment, so it doesn't really, yeah. Reading book doesn't really tell you anything. Or it's just taking, you know, your MPV is uh, for project life. Okay. MPV infinity is just taking that line and stretching it. That's all. Yeah. So it's actually the uh, computation that's, uh, um, yeah. Like for example. Oh yeah, they're all there. But I mean, if you want to look at the uh, MPV infinity. What this is doing is just taking your NPV. And, uh, and what is the difference between this NPV formula and this? This is relating NPV to equivalent annual value. Yeah. So I have to read. No, if <laughs> again, if you look at the eye lecture, things will become a bit clearer. Okay. It's basically to say, okay, once we have the NPV of our project, it's 
base, $100. Okay. What, what Simon said, okay, we take the $100 and we spread it evenly over each of the project's years. Okay. The reason is because with uh, MPV Infinity, with EAV and with lowest common multiples, we are trying to standardize our MPV numbers for projects that have different investment horizons. The reason is because if they have different horizons, you cannot just pick the largest MPV. So we need to evaluate them on a standardized uh, horizon. Give you an example, very quick one. Uh, a one-year project and a four-year project. Um, the four-year project's MPV is uh, 120, the one year is 100. Now, if you just look at 120 and 100, you'll say, oh, 120 is better. But hang on, the 120 is four, four years. years. So one year. Yeah, so it's just scaling it. Any problem? Can I ask? Yeah, I'm always um, um, available for doing office hours on Fridays. But if you make an effort to catch up, I'm happy to see you tomorrow or, or, or maybe make a time. Okay. Later on. But you have to try to catch up. And, yeah. Uh, to make a time if you can't make Friday. But try to have a look at the uh, workshop slides. Have a listen. I scan all my um, writing as well and uh, tutorial questions and answers. If you can handle those things then. Oh, you're doing all right, yeah.
Right, let's uh, restart the workshop, shall we? Okay, just uh, before we go back to uh, uh, we continue with uh, our discussion on rights issues. Just a recap on this uh, calculus. <laughs> Example two that I've um, uh, calculated with you at the beginning of uh, today's workshop. Um, one of your classmates uh, pointed out a uh, careless mistake on my part for this uh, component number four. Okay. So uh, thanks to the student, but uh, I guess I can just uh, use that as uh, uh, to to discuss this with the uh, rest of you. What's wrong with this calculation? Th th this component 4 corresponds to this uh, picture here. What have I, what's wrong with the calculation? I forgot to attach uh, 0 0.8, okay? It's a 0 0.8 probability of high demand, so I need to multiply 0 0.8 to these two terms. Not 0 0.8 million, but 80% chance of me getting this in the first place. Okay, so make sure you uh, uh, multiply this by um, 0 0.8. Okay, so it's multiplied by 0 0.8 okay. because um, 0 0.8, 80% chance of high demand applies to the first two years as well. Okay. Right. Let's continue with. Uh, um, rights issues so that I don't run out of time again like what I did for the last two weeks. Um, okay, I guess the key question is, okay, why would a rights issue trigger a fall in the share price? Now, you know that if a company declares a dividends, on the ex-dividend date, the share price falls by roughly the amount of the dividends. Um, and there's different explanations for it. But because of time, I won't go into that. I'll use a Let's settle down so we can all get out and take a shower and whatever, okay? <laughs> I can't imagine what my wife's going to say to me when I fetch her from the train station. My goodness, what have you been doing? I thought you were teaching today. Um, okay, let's uh, settle down so we can... Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this simple calculation is to demonstrate to us why is it that... Um, um, that, that um, there will be a dilution or the share price would actually fall corresponding to a rights issue. Okay? Now, these are just some numbers that I make up and those numbers click or not just because 1,000 divided by 100 is $10. Um, you can read it in the following. This is the price per share. Settle down, please. Okay? This is the price per share. 100 is the number of shares outstanding. So the market value of equity is uh, 1,000. Okay, so 1,000 divided by a number of shares outstanding, 100 gives you a share price of $10 or $10 per share. Okay, so these three numbers click in the following sense: total market value of equity 1,000, 100 shares outstanding, $10 per share. Imagine if we were to make a rights issue. Okay, if I were to make a rights issue and just for illustration purposes, just one share. Now, if I were to issue that one new share to existing shareholders, but I'm issuing at the current market price of 10, it means that the company takes in $10. Okay, so if I issue one new share to all of you as an existing shareholder, but for whatever reason, I'm issuing it at the current market price of $10, it means I'm taking $10 at the numerator. Okay? So if I add 10 to the top for one new share, what happens to the share price after everything finishes? The, the, the share price is still 10. 1010 zero, one, zero divided by 101 one is still 10. Okay, so nothing happens. So if you can see this, you can understand why is it that uh, a rights issue would actually trigger the share price to fall. Because rights issues are always made at discounts. So you would never make a rights issue at $10. You would always make it at some lower price. 
some price that is lower than the current market price. Okay, so I'll just uh, for to be sure that you can follow this. Um, Same example as before, 1,000 divided by 100, which is $10 per share, okay, the current situation. If we issue one new share at a discount, at a 50% discount, so the current market price is 10, I'm offering you at five. So the company takes in $5. The answer to this, I don't care what calculator you use, it must be a number that is, that is what? Smaller than one. It must be less than 10. It has to be less than 10. So hence, your share price would fall from $10 to whatever this answer is, depending on your calculator. Okay? So that's why the share price would fall. Okay? And more than that, what can we say about the, the, the two uh, key features of a rights issue event as far as ex existing shareholders are concerned? The amount of dilution and the amount, sorry, the amount of discounting on the, the amount of discounting associated with a rights issue on one hand and the amount of dilution that's going to be the result of this rights issue. What can we say about those two uh, variables? The more heavily discounting a rights issue involves, the what? The amount of dilution. So if a rights issue is made with a lot of discounting of the current market price, then what can we say about the amount of dilution that's going to take place? <laughs> what I'm trying to ask is um, more discounting implies more dilution or less dilution? More, yeah. Because you see, if you are issuing, okay, back to this example, if you are issuing one new share, let's say at $9, okay, the share price is going to fall by a bit. It's a 1009 divided by 101. If you offer one new share at a 50% discount, that's going to be an even lower number. If you offer one new share at just one dollar, the numerator is one zero zero one. It's going to be even smaller. Okay. So the heavier the discounting involved with a rice issue, the more the share price is going to fall. Okay. There's going to be more dilution. Okay. So those two things go together. Okay. So keep that in mind. Having said that, the issue price that is made is conceptually irrelevant to you. You don't really. Actually, if you're an existing shareholder, you don't really care whether it is a 10% discount, 50% discount, 30% discount, 70% discount. Now, you know that the more discounting involves, the better the deal it is for you on one hand. So you say, wow, if, if I'm able to buy new shares at a 70% discount, that's got to be a bargain, isn't it? No, because if, it's, if the rice issue is being made at a 70% discount, what can we actually say is going to happen sooner or later? The share price is going to fall by a lot. Okay? So although you are able to buy new shares at a discount, but then again the share price falls. So one actually washes against the other. Okay? So that's one way of uh, looking at it. Okay? So that's why you don't really care whether it is offered at a 10% discount, 20% discount, or 50% discount. The more discounting involved with a rice issue, the more the share price is going to fall. So that overall, it doesn't really, ha it shouldn't have any impact on you as an existing shareholder. That is, of course, what. For me to say that, okay, I'm benefiting. We know that if shares are offered through a rice issue at a discount, the share price is going to fall. Provided I do one of two things. Number one. I participate in the rights issue, which means that I get the benefit in terms of being able to buy new shares at a discount, so I experience the benefit, and that benefit will compensate me for the subsequent diluted share price. That's one scenario where one hand washes against the other. What is the other scenario? If for whatever reason I do not wish to participate and subscribe to the rights issue myself, I must make sure that I do what? I sell the rights. If I sell the rights, I get compensation. Now, the more heavily discounted the rights issues is made at, what can we say about the value of those rights? They're going to be more valuable, which means I get more compensation for to the subsequent larger foreign share price. And I'm, I still don't care whether it is offered at 10% discount, 20% discount. But to avoid the dilution of my wealth, I must make sure that either I subscribe to it myself or 
I renounce my rights to third parties and that is going to compensate me for the subsequent share price dilution. Okay, so that's how this, all this, uh, how this, the, the mechanics works. If you do not participate and if you do not sell your rights, then you don't get any benefit, but you will still have a falling wealth because of the diluted share price later on. Okay, so you must make sure that uh, to do this, uh, one hand washes against the other. Okay, so keep that in mind as uh, an existing uh, rights holder, uh, an existing shareholder, and you're you're being offered a rights issue. Okay. So these are the terms that, uh, the relevant terms that need to come together. I stand for issue price, uh, C stands for the cum rights share price or the pre, uh, X is the post, C is the pre, and R is the value of the right, N is etc. etc. Okay. So rather than reading all this to you, what I'll do is the following. Okay. Okay, the price before the uh, X right date. You see, the X right date is, is the cutoff point to decide whether or not you're entitled to the rights that comes with owning shares. After this date, if you buy um, shares from directly from the stock market, you are no longer entitled to the rights. You still get the shares, but the shares don't come with the rights. So the X right date is sort of like your X dividend date. It's the cutoff point to decide whether or not you are entitled to the rights that comes with the share. Okay. So C is the price that is uh, before the is the share price before the cutoff date. X is the price after the cutoff date, and I is the issue price. Okay, the price that you are being offered to subscribe to new shares. And uh, just a very quick check, um, anyone? What can we say about the value of C and the value of I? A very simple check. I must be. It must be smaller than C. Remember, we must issue make rights issues at a discount of current share price. Okay. So these are the three uh, prices there, and they are listed here for you as well. Now the other two uh, notations that are important for a rights issue are the following. R and N. Okay. R is the value of the right. To buy one new share at a discount. Okay, the value to buy one new share at a discount. Okay, R is the value of the right to buy one new share at a discount. So it is the value attached to one new share. Now, what about N? Yeah, that's right. It, it is also related to that. Uh, see, both notations are related to one new share. R is the value of the right to buy one new share, and N is the number of existing shares you have to hold to be able to buy one new share. So R and N are centered on one new share. Okay, so that's why I write those two numbers together. Okay, so keep those uh, notations in mind. Okay. Um, R is the value of right for one share, and N is the number of shares you have to hold for one new share. Okay, so those are the uh, two notations. And just as a very uh, quick check with you, if I see what I have here is a one for four rights issue. Now, what that simply means in words is, for every four shares that you hold, you are entitled to buy one new share at a discount. Okay, let's start with a simple one. Uh, one for six. What is the value of n? Very simply, six. So far so good. Two for seven. <laughs> Come on, even under current suboptimal conditions, you don't need a calculator to do that. <laughs> what is a two for, for a two for seven rights issue? In other words, for every seven shares, we give you the right to buy two new shares. What is the value of n? 3.5. Okay, so took a while, doesn't matter. Last try, three for eight rights issue. Value of n. <laughs> two and two third. Okay, it's eight divided by three. Okay. In any case, n is always defined as the number of shares for one new share. Okay. So if it's a three for eight, make sure it is a one for two and two third, and so on and so forth. Okay. So please don't make those careless mistakes. Okay. In the assignment, in the exam, multiple choice or whatever. Okay. 
So those are the uh, um, setup and the notations. Okay. Now these are the two um, um, expressions that I've uh, shown you before. The the value of the right to buy one new share is calculated with uh, n c minus i and n plus one, and the post. So the share price, sorry, the diluted share price or the theoretical x right price, the value of x, is nc plus i over n plus 1. So those are the two simple calculations. Once you work out the numbers for c, i, x, sorry, for c, i, and n, you can easily work out r and x. Okay, so, so that part of it is always easy. What is uh, not as easy is to actually gauge where the heck does these two expressions come from. I mean, they don't just appear out of nowhere. You know, it's not like a uh, net cash flow in the first year, second year, third year, we discount them back, etc., etc. So there must be some sort of basic story behind those uh, two expressions. And indeed, there is. Now, the, uh, it might sound that, like I'm sidetracking a bit, but uh, I don't know how to say this. The, this could be one of the, uh, these are the sort of things that uh, you don't really get from textbooks, you see. The reason why those two expressions are superior to any of the expressions we've covered thus far is because of the following. They come from a conceptual structure. Now, all financial models and theories are governed by one of three axioms. And these are the following. The first one is the so-called market efficiency or no free lunch theorem. Okay, so that's the first that governs uh, uh, any core finance uh, concept. The second one, and you would know this, is this uh, idea of risk return trade-off. So your Markowitz frontier, your capital asset pricing model is governed by the second axiom, risk return trade-off. And last but not least is the following. is the axiom of no arbitrage law of one price. So if uh, two different sets of transactions give you the same security, then the cost involved with those two transactions must be the same. Otherwise, you can have an arbitrage opportunity. So all finance theories are governed by either market efficiency or the so-called no free lunch argument, risk return trade-off, or no arbitrage uh, law of one price, which is from, um, yeah. Okay, so it's one of these three. And those two expressions there are governed by the third axiom, the no arbitrage law of one price argument. So that's what we are trying to use to. That's how. That's where those two expressions came from, and the, uh, the 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 demonstration. And this is something I put in the tutorial as well. Is actually quite straightforward. So this will give you a glimpse into how all the key finance concepts actually come from. All the expressions are actually stories. They reflect stories going on behind the scene. Okay. So this is the only chance I have to share that insight with you. Very simple. You got two strategies. Do not mix one and strategy one and two together. Okay? Within strategy one, there's two different transactions. Within strategy two, there's two different transactions. Okay? So let's focus on strategy one. I want you to uh, um, have a thing about two very simple questions. For the two trans sets of transactions in strategy one, what have you got? So what do you end up obtaining if you were to execute each of those two strategy, uh, transactions in strategy one? And the second question is, how much does it cost you? So let's start with an easy one. What have you obtained? If you were to buy N shares before the X right date versus if you were to buy N shares and buy one right after the X right date. So let's start with the easy one. Um, if you buy N shares and buy one right after the X right date, what have you got? You, you simply got N shares and one right, duh. <laughs> okay, so, so that's what you've got with, the, um, with this line buy N shares and one right. Now, if you buy N shares before the X right date, after the X right date, what have you got? If you buy N shares before the X right date, you get N shares, but you've also got one right. So whether it is the first line or the second line, it gives you N shares and one right. So you get the same thing. So what that is going to imply, according to law of one price, is that the cost of me doing, the cost of me buying N shares before the X right date, and the cost of me buying N shares after the X right date and buying one right should be the same. Okay. 
So very simply, what is the cost to me of buying N shares before the um, X write date? What notation should I use? If I buy N shares before, if before the X write date, the price is simply C. Now, if I were to buy after, it is N X, but I'm also buying one write, and the value is R. So if I have the same entity, regardless of the first or second line, these two should be equal. Okay, so that's the first equation. Now, if you can understand this, then second strategy is even simpler. It's exactly the same uh, simple argument. Okay, so let's go through this a bit quicker. After the X write date, I buy one share. Now, if I buy one share, I own one share. Okay, that's easy. If I buy one write and if I exercise it, I end up with one share as well. So either way, I end up with one share. So the cost of the two transactions should be the same. If I buy one share, the cost to me is X. If I buy, if I buy one write and if I exercise it, the cost to me is R. I, I don't want to stay here all night, okay. R plus. If I exercise it, I need to subscribe to it, so what do I pay? Okay, R plus I. So X equals R plus I. And this is your equation 2. Now you know that equation 2, the X in equation 2 is part of equation 1. So it's just a matter of 2 go into 1. And you should end up with uh, that expression there. Okay? I was going to give you a 10 second leeway, but again, given current circumstances, I'll just do it myself. Okay? But this is something that you, uh, most of you should be able to easily do. Okay? Uh, the substitution. Okay, so the value of R is do this uh, simple substitution from, I don't know, year six. Um, R is uh, N C minus, C minus I over N plus one, which is exactly what you have there. Now, if you then substitute R back to equation two, because in equation two, R is uh, simply there, you'll get the value of X quite easily. Okay? And if you were to do that, um, I, I won't do the second one with you. If you put the value of R back into equation two, you get um, the second expression, x is uh, nc plus i divided by n plus 1. So that's where, where all those, uh, the two expressions uh, come from. Okay. See, they come from equation 1 um, and equation 2. Okay. So those are the two equations. But you see, equation 1 comes from strategy 1. Equation 2 comes from strategy 2. So it comes from this uh, law of one price, no arbitrage argument. Okay. So that's the origin of those um, um, two expressions. Now, if we were to, let's throw in some numbers and get a sense of um, applying those two formulas now that we have a glimpse of where they come from. And indeed, there's another reason why I show you the origin of these two equations, okay? But let's throw in some numbers too so that we become a bit more comfortable with uh, things to come. Okay, it's a one for four rights issue. So with that, I know that the value of N is four. Okay, it's one for four, so N is four. C is uh, six dollars. And the issue price I is five dollars. Okay, so I know that C is six, C is uh, six dollars, I is five, etc., etc. So the value of R is simply uh, six minus five times n, which is four, divided by n plus one, which is five. Okay, very simply. So it's zero point eight. That's the value of the right. Work through the numbers. That's why I gave it to you. Okay, because it's very straightforward calculation. The theoretical x right price is uh, five dollars eighty cents. So the share price falls from six dollars to five dollars eighty cents. And there you have it. So the value, this calculation is as simple as it gets. Okay, the value of R and the value of X. Again, because it's one for four, uh, the value of N is four, and N plus one is four plus one. But please keep in mind, if I give you something like two for seven, make sure the value of N is uh, three point five. <laughs> Took me long enough. Okay, it's three point five, and so on and so forth. Okay, so so in terms of the calculations, they are quite easy. Now, there's, another re there's a reason why I gave you that last line. Now, what, what is the last line trying to say? 
what is the value of the right that is attached to each existing share? So I seem to be uh, contemplating the idea that, okay, it's not just the value of the right of 80 cents, the right to buy one new share is worth 80 cents, but I'm asking the value of the right associated with each existing share. Uh, the answer is uh, 20 cents. How do I get 20 cents? Uh, it's not a trick question, it should be quite simple. The worth of the right is 80 cents, but in order to capture or to receive that right, how many shares do I have to hold? Which means that the value of the right which means the value of the right associated with each of those four shares is simply 20 cents. 0 0.8 divided by 2. Okay, so that part is um, simple enough, I hope. Now, in terms of the uh, notations, it is also quite uh, simple. R, if I were to generalize it, R is associated with N. For every N shares I hold, I receive the value of R, in this case 80 cents. What is the value associated with 1? existing shares. It is simply R over N. The worth attached to each existing share before the x write date. Once we pass the x write date, what can you say about each existing share? When we, when we you know, go past the due date. Now, before the due date, if, if I'm somewhere along here, each existing share has with it a value that is R divided by N. Okay, we're sort of clear on that. What actually happens after this date, when I pass this date? The benefit actually? What happens to the benefit for each existing share? It actually it disappears. Now if the benefit actually disappears, what should happen to the share price then? It should fall by the amount of the benefit. What is the benefit? R over N. And that's why these numbers make sense too. Can you see what's happening here? Before the x write date, the share price is actually $6. After the x write date, the share price is $5.80. Each share has fallen by $0.20, cents, which is simply R over N. Now, if I were to then forget the formulas, forget strategy, if I want to say something, if I want to make a very basic description about the fall in share price or the amount of dilution, on one hand I can say, okay, based on these notations, what, what is the fall in share price? Now, the fall in share price is simply C minus X. Before the date is C, after the date is X. So I'm saying that the fall is simply C minus X. I'm just making a very pretty obvious statement on one hand. Okay? So this is the fall in the share price. But on the other hand, I'm also saying what? That the amount of the fall can be represented by R divided by N. So the fall in share price should equal to R over N, isn't it? I'm just saying, okay, based on your notations, C is the price before, X is the price after, so the fall is simply C minus X. And on the other hand, I'm saying, okay, the value that is attached to each existing share is measured by R over N. So after the X write date, each share would fall by R over N, which is this. Okay. It seems that I've uh, made a discussion on something just by repeating the obvious. We've all moving to the last slide. Would anyone like to say something about this expression that just comes out of you know, descriptions and wording? What can you actually say about this expression? And you're pretty good if you can actually uh, answer. What's so special deja vu about this expression? Yeah, you can get R from the rest of it, that's for sure, but something a bit more impressive, a bit more insightful about this expression? This is equation one. <laughs> Don't believe me? This is equation one. Okay, so equation one actually uh, tells you what's going to happen in terms of the share price change and the amount that each share is going to drop by. Okay, everything comes from equation one. Now, if at this stage, if you can't see why is this equation one, then I'll be a bit worried, but this is actually equation one. Okay, uh, I'm sure you can figure that out soon enough, okay? 
The other, another important reason why I show you the, uh, the origin of those two expressions is the following, the limitations. See, when you use these uh, expressions, they are not always right. Um, they give you rough guides, but they are not exactly right. The reason is because of uh, this so-called, the set of things that we call market imperfections. But you see, rather than going through and memorizing textbooks to say, okay, uh, it, it may not work because of transaction costs, uh, it may not work because of information, it may not work because of text treatments, it may not work because of if the rights are not sellable, what I've done is I've shown you where those equations come from. They come from strategy one and strategy two. In other words, if you are able to say something about the limitations in terms of executing strategy one and or strategy two, those limitations automatically become the, those uh, limitations become the assumption, or in other words, they become the limitation in applying the two expressions. Because if whatever things you can say that affects the execution of strategy one and two becomes the limitations of these two expressions, because it comes from the action. So rather than memorizing the thing, I'll just go back to this, and we'll discuss a bit on this, and then we'll finish today's uh, workshop. What would actually affect my implementation of strategy, uh, let's say strategy two, for example. For me to say, I can always buy one right and I execute it. What could actually prevent that from happening? Something very simple, anyone? To, to, to say, okay, for strategy two, I need to compare two things. One of the things I need to compare is buy one right and exercise it. What could prevent me from doing that? Simply because? the rights are non-renounceable. If the rights are not tradable, I cannot execute strategy two. And actually, I cannot execute strategy one as well because I have to buy one right. If I'm not able to buy the right, that means that the expression, um, these two expressions, which comes from this, is flawed because it assumes that the rights are renounceable. It assumes that the rights are tradable. And indeed, that's what I said here. But I mean, you don't have to memorize it. You just need to know that... Uh, you know, it comes from this story, so if there's a limitation that affects this story, it affects the expression as well. Okay, so that's one example. Another one? Now, for strategy one, I'm comparing two different sets of transaction. If on one hand, it's one actual transaction, if on the other hand, it involves two separate transactions, then in the presence of transaction cost, those two are not the same. Now, if they're not the same, that means that my formula is contaminated in the presence of transaction cost. Thirdly, if the tax treatment on one versus the other is different, it would also affect the formulas as well. Okay? So whatever affects the story affects the formula because the formula comes from the story. So it is not something that you need to memorize. I mean, whatever affects arbitrage affects the formulas that are governed by arbitrage stories as well. So that's something that I used to uh, try to remember things about limitations of um, expressions that, that the, uh, my teachers have taught me and say, oh, why might they not work under certain situations? So one of the key will be the rights are not tradable, transaction costs, tax treatments, and of course our story here about arbitrage says nothing about information signaling and all those uh, information effects. So if those rights issue comes with information effects there, then it, it contaminates our argument as well. Our, ours is a very pure, straightforward arbitrage argument. So if there's information signaling, it affects the expression as well. So they are good guides, but they will never be exactly correct because of all these market imperfections that affect strategy one and strategy two. So that's how you know not just where they come from, but their limitations as well. Okay, so that's with uh, rights issue. Other than that, the calculations are pretty straightforward. So next week, we'll look at the IPO underpricing and uh, underwriting. Okay, I'll see you next week. All right, thank you. Oh, this is X. X, right? Sorry, I might have... Well, yeah.
Because this is saying um, the price before and the price after. So okay, C yeah. minus X is the drop. X. Michael, sorry, uh, what was the last step of this uh, example two? Step one, step two, step three. Yeah, Roman, in your, uh, I think, uh, in your... Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do it directly from here. Um, but, but I think you have done Yeah, I know, uh, we can do it directly from here. Uh, for, step, for component four, yeah. uh, we got uh, net cash flow okay. for the first two years, okay. even high demand. <laughs> Don't explain me. Only you know, tell me the four step. Because if I will have any doubt, I can you know come down to your no, office to meet no. you.